Emotion, as we saw in the previous class, is not to be confused with feeling, since its essential note is the readiness of the will with which we give ourselves to the service of God. Devotion, therefore, is based on a permanent disposition, but usually receives the technical name of habit. Now, it is the habit that allows us to produce, here and now, as the concrete circumstances demand, that actable without which it becomes impossible not only to fulfill duty, but to go beyond duty and act out of love and generosity. But if devotion can be characterized in terms of a habitual, permanent and stable disposition, by virtue of which we become willing to serve God, how can it grow and develop? First of all, we need to be aware of the fact that, as some Thomas Aquinas points out one, the extrinsic and main cause of devotion can only be God himself. It is he, in fact, who gives to anyone who wants the grace to be a devotee, in such a way that, if he had wanted to, he could have aroused the most religious spirits among the most indifferent Samaritans. Like any habit, however, devotion can and must grow in our souls through our personal effort. That is why Aquinas affirms without fear that the intrinsic cause of devotion, that is, the one that depends on us, is meditation or contemplation too. And the reason for this is clear. The proper object of the will is the end to be under the reason of good, that is, while it is desirable. It turns out that the will can only tend to a certain good to the extent that it is, to a greater or lesser degree, known to the will. Nil volat nisi precognitium, says an old philosophical axiom, nothing can be desired if it is not known before, apprehended by the intellect. Otherwise, the will would not even have news, so to speak, of the good that attracts it. Therefore, the more intensely we know of good, the more ardently we desire it, the more firmly we are willing to pay the price of owning it. Now, devotion, as stated above, consists in the practice of an act of the will by which man readily surrenders to divine service. 3. For this reason, devotion will be more and more intense and profound the greater our knowledge of its object, that is, divine service and, ultimately, God himself, whom we wish to serve. And it is meditation for, above all, of divine goodness and the countless benefits with which the Lord favors our misery, the means of seeing with an increasingly penetrating and passionate look how gentle is the Lord P.S. 33, 9. If it is out of consideration of the greatness of God and the smallness of man that devotion is born, how can this precious gift not flourish in our meditation by meditating on the greatest good that Jesus has given us, his own mother, the most perfect of creatures, and of the most excellent of the benefits with which he enriched us, the spiritual motherhood of Mary most holy? What an extraordinary grace it is to have you as mother and intercessor. What an invaluable treasure the Lord gave us when he spoke those words, addressing all men, figured in the person of the beloved disciple. Behold, your mother J.N. 19, 26. May our understanding, then, plunge into these truths, as sweet as they are sublime, and that, in this light, our will may seek with haste and prompt hope the union of love that God wants to love with us.